anything you got. <laughs> Bobby, thank you for sharing that. It, uh, it moved my heart. And uh, it's exciting when God has given you a gift and a talent that uh, you use it to serve him. And I can tell you that um, from the gifts that God gave him, we took the track that he essentially designed. And that was a prototype for many other Pinewood Derby tracks because parents have a difficult time working through all those issues. Um, it is, it, it, you have been a peacemaker. <laughs> you know, and so, uh, but it was exciting. We took that track to Oshkosh uh, for the Pathfinder Campery, and uh, I tell you, it was just uh, amazing. And God uses any possible means for His glory. Mm -hmm. And He can use a Pinewood Derby. Uh, electronic device and, and Bobby's skills and uh, it's just uh, appreciating you know that, that you're willing to, to utilize it for his glory so anyways let me pray before we begin father uh, it is so good to come before you on the Sabbath day what a joy and a privilege it is to come here to worship you to bring to lift up your name it's something we should do every day Lord that we come together that we come before you, that we worship you. But it's a special celebration on your Sabbath. And I pray, Lord, as words are shared, uh, you know a little of the backstory this morning, but all, all this that happened this morning, we, want, we desire it to be to your honor and glory through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God spoke to Elijah, and he said that in three years, for three years, you're going to be into a major drought. And I want you to tell Ahab, I want you to tell Israel, as I was driving on Route 64 this morning, um, I'm going to make a declaration. Southern Illinois is not in a drought. <laughs> Many of you drove down there this morning, wow. It reminded me of the rice fields uh, when I lived in California. Just, uh, just beds of water everywhere. And I just also remember living in Paradise, California, where the which is no longer there, unfortunately, through the fires. But uh, we, it wouldn't rain for five months. Um, but for three years, it's hard to imagine. So that was the news that Elijah was, uh, was given by God to tell Israel. And then we may know the story of, of how he told Elijah to go into the wilderness. And he would take care of him. Did he take care of him? Abs absolutely. Something just to note on that, uh, we find this, I believe it's in 1 Kings 17, we're going to be spending a lot of time in 1 Kings 18 and 19 as well, as we're going to capture most of our story. But, so anyway, so God fed him with ravens. What Do you remember what, what the ravens brought him? Bread and what? I know we had a little bit of a vegetarian conversation this morning, but it was bread and meat. You know, what's interesting about that is, what was at the king's table? Bread and meat. So God is saying, even though you're going to go into a drought because you are my faithful servant, my faithful prophet, I want you to live like a king. Isn't that incredible? Just a little side story to all of that. But there's so many things that took place. We have the, the widow of Zarephath, as you remember, that uh, the oil was plentiful and she was able to make bread that nobody else could, and they survived on that. We know that the story of the, the son who died, and he laid his body and came back to life, and we know that um, in, in um, that Jezebel was on, on loose in that story. And because of this message, who did she blame? All of the prophets of God, and she tried to kill all of them. And they were looking everywhere for Elijah. I mean, everywhere, every country, they would go there and look for him, and they could not find him under God's protection. But he spoke to Ahab, he says, I will send rain to the earth, in 18 verse 1, in 1 Kings. I will bring rain to the earth. But in the meantime, Obadiah had, been, had worked with the, in the king's palace, uh, he was similar to the, probably the role of Joseph to the pharaoh, and uh, he had secretly protected a hundred prophets, hid them in two different caves, and he, and he fed them what? Bread and water. Somehow he organized all that. But he met up with Elijah on the way, their paths crossed, probably God designed that. And, and as they met, Elijah said, go tell the king I'm here. 
That seems like a simple request, but, it, but Obadiah was not excited about that message because if he told the king that Elijah was here and he'd been looking everywhere and Elijah wasn't there when he got back, he feared for his own life. So it was a mixed message. But anyways, he followed through, he trusted Elijah, King Ahab came, they had the meeting, and the first thing the king says to Elijah is in verse 18, 17, it is you, troubler of Israel. And then God had issued a challenge that he wanted Elijah to tell Ahab. Because as we know, what was happening in that area is it was entirely immersed in every form of idolatry. So I want to have a, a, a kind of a great controversy battle, if you want to call it that. We're going, to, we're going to see whose God is real right here. We're going to do a, a test. And we know the storyline. And we have where they went to Mount Carmel. And we know the story, right? It uh, was very clearly stated that if, if the Lord is God, follow him. And if Baal, follow him. So this is the big test. And we know that God showed up. I'm not going to get into all that story. I'm just going to highlight a few things. But the truth is 450 prophets were destroyed that day because God consumed the entire altar and the, 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 the meat and, and the water below and everything around it. There was literally nothing left unmistakable that God intervened in the fire that came down from heaven. But God plus one is a majority. God plus one is a majority. He needed one prophet. Even though there were probably more than 450, there were prophets of Asherah, which there were another 400 there. So there, there were more than that, actually, in that area. And this is similar as we look at our earth and the history and we look at prophecies our church is noted for. We also realize that this is kind of a little mini great controversy. All right? We're coming to the end. We're coming to a deciding point where we have to stay on one side, stand on one side versus the other. And, and I, you know, again, it's just realizing that God is real and that we need to follow him today through all of this. That we need to stand up in the same way and repent and say, look, I want to serve you, God, fully. So there's some parallels there. Now we go to um, 18 verse 37. I'm sorry, 1 Kings 18, verse 41 to 46. So the event has taken place. The, the 450 uh, prophets are, are killed. And there, there's a, a complete repentance. The children of Israel at that time bow themselves on the ground and they say, Hey, we will serve the Lord. This is the true God. So the, the time was ripe for revival, let's put it that way, at that very moment. And so, as promised, there was rain that was coming. We have the posture of Elijah in 1 Kings 18, 41. We'll go there and read till 46. Here we go. 41, 46. And then Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink. And there is the sound of the abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink. And Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. And then he bowed down on the ground. He put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, go now and look toward the sea. So he went up and he looked, and there, there is nothing. And seven times said, go again. Then it came to pass the seventh time, he said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand, sitting at the sea, rising up out of the sea. So he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot, and go before the rain stops you. Stops you. Seven times is an interesting number in Scripture, right? But I think there's something critical to point out as we face troubling times, as we face the days ahead of us that are already here, you could argue, that's going on around us. But he put his face between his knees. Seems like an unusual practice. But in actuality, um, it's signified of an intense soul, his whole soul poured out in prayer. Every part of his being, that's kind of symbolic of doing that in that culture in that time. So he just poured himself out in prayer, pleading and claiming. He never gave up. 
seven times. He could have said, after three times, Lord, this must not be true. You know, I, I don't know if we can trust your word. We can't take you at your word because nothing's happening yet. But he claimed God's promises. And I think that is uh, an incredible lesson of faith here on his part. And I like a, um, a definition of faith I heard one time. I believe his name is Jim Cimbala. He's the pastor of the um, Brooklyn Tabernacle Church. He made a, a great definition of faith. He said, faith is believing that God's promises cannot fail. I love that definition. And that's exactly what Elijah did. He, God spoke to him. He said he was going to do this. He believed it, and he continued to pray, uh, expecting that God would be true to his promise. And that's a great lesson in, for us that here today. And we know that the little small cloud the size of a hand is also a symbolic experience as well, as we know that that's the way God will return. So there's a lot of parallel here, parallels here I want to capture. So we know from that the floodgates open, that the intense rain started, and it actually uh, stopped the chariot. You ever been in a car and you're driving along like I did last night, um, and you just can't barely see the hand in front of you? let alone try to drive a vehicle in torrential downpours. That's probably like what it was. So here we have a chariot, and he's probably very disoriented, not sure which direction he's going. And God gave Elijah superhuman strength and endurance and speed to stand in front of the king in his chariot. It was kind of the first marathon. It was about 20 miles from that area to Jezreel with the cap with the, the the palace was. But there's some significance to this because number one, it was a sign of respect to the king. A sign of respect to walk that way in front. Well, in this case, run. All right? So he became a guide for Ahab's chariot, respecting him still as king, even though there was zero respect that Ahab showed towards Elijah. He wanted to, to kill him. It's amazing how this diffuses Ahab, and we'll see that developing. But uh, so they get there to the palace, and he stops there, and then what happens? Ahab goes in, and he explains to Jezebel all the exciting things that just happened, what, what God did miraculously. And he's, he's probably really energized, but by, and Jezebel was just as energized. She was so excited for what happened, right? No, not at all, not at all, because she just lost uh, a couple hundred of her friends, and she's lost her workforce, and she's not happy. Okay, in fact, what does she do? She sends a hitman, sends a messenger. Who does she send? A messenger. Now, that's interesting. Why didn't she send kind of a sharpshooter? Just take him out once and for all. She's got to be very upset. Just destroy the religion of the whole country, her religion, and all of her workers. And, and the, the easiest thing to do, in, in our opinion today, would just be go out there and, you know, bow and arrow, whatever method, and, and take him out. But she doesn't do that. You have to ask the question, why? Well, we know God was still protecting Elijah. That's first. But secondly... She knew, she knew, and she heard what just happened with her country. Everyone repented to the one true God. And she was wise enough to know the best thing was not to take his life, because the people may have rebelled, but to scare him a little bit. And how did that work? It worked actually quite effectively. So then we read on, let me read uh, 1 Kings 19, 1 to 4 that goes along with that. 1 Kings 19, 1 to 4. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had ex executed all the prophets with a sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods to do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow at this time. There's a threat. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. And went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. 
But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat on her broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. So even though all of the incredible, amazing things that he had just experienced from God, the, the victory right there, and the miracles that he experienced time and time again, he runs. And it's sometimes hard to comprehend that. We can look at that and go, why did he do that? It's hard to understand. But just a little geography here. Jezreel to Beersheba is about 120 miles. So he had a long couple day or two or however long it took him to do. That's a long way. The Bible just said he ran. So I don't know if he stopped every now and then or he still had that energy that God gave him. He just kind of took off out there and he left his servant and he went probably another 30 miles beyond that, another day's journey. So 150 miles he's running from, in a sense, himself and God. So here he is. But what should have Elijah have done? We can create a, a picture of what should he have done here. He should have stayed, right? Put his head between his knees again, pray seven more times and um, that God would do something with Jezebel, but the people of that country were primed for revival, and, and he could have gone in there and just spoke the word and had a, an evangelistic series and, and just got everyone back on track. You'd think that would have been the best thing to do, right? But he didn't. All that he had seen, instead of trusting God's protection, one, one powerful woman swayed him. And he was fearful. So no, he didn't do a lot of the things you, you, you would have expected him to do. And he says, it's enough, Lord, take my life, or I'm no better than, than, than my father's. He knew that he has failed at this. He knew that this wasn't the right thing to do. He knew all of that. And he was lamenting about his choice. I like the words um, in the book Prophets and King by Ella White. It's in page 157. Here's what she said. Pretty powerful. But he who has been blessed with so many evidences of God's loving care was not above the human frailties of mankind. Wow. Can, you, can we identify with that today? I hope we do. Because there's a lot of grace and mercy in that statement that I think we need to take to heart. Even though, even God's faithful prophets, the one was taken to heaven with him before he saw death, struggled mightily. Went through hills and valleys and highs and lows and went through to probably depression here and, and discouragement here, really struggled. He became kind of a slave to doubt, went through all of the human experiences that you and I go through, even a prophet struggled. Even all, all the victories, all the wonderful things, we are all prone to some of these struggles. But there's hope in all this story, isn't there? There's a lot of hope. So let's continue on. Reading verse uh, 19, verse 5 and 6. Finally, sleep was needed. 19, verse 5 and 6. It says, uh, Then he lay and he slept under a broom tree. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And I'll read a few more verses. Then he looked and there on his head, uh, by his head was a cake baked in coals and a jar of water. So he ate and he drank and he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. The journey is too great for you. Hold that thought. You know, I, I think the first thing he must have imagined when he woke up, someone maybe jostled, the angel jostled him, but he woke up, he probably expected to see who? Maybe Jezebel. I'm back. Or, or you know, one of his soldiers or something. And I'm sure he was startled out of his sleep. And what did he see? The caring, loving face of an angel who says, I have something prepared for you. I know you're exhausted. I know you're in a really rough place. I know you're going through a lot. But I'm here to take care of you. I'm here for you. 
Now, I don't know about you, but if, if, if an angel woke me up and I see this bright thing and just served me a, a great hot breakfast and had some water for me, um, I'm, not, I'm not going back to sleep. I am wide awake. An angel, okay. He was so mentally and physically and maybe spiritually exhausted, he just went right back to sleep. I see angels probably just shaking their hand and going, ah, okay, well, let's try this again. Another shakeup. And the food lasted how long? 40 days. Well, that's pretty good, uh, pretty good nourishment there. So when God provides you food, it's nourishing. It's strengthening. So we fed him again, and, and, you know, it's just God just knows what we need. He knows when we need it. He knows how we need it. And I praise him for his love and care of each one of us. And we know the true bread of life, don't we? We know the real bread of life. The only thing truly in life that can sustain us is Jesus is our bread of life that we're going to experience here shortly. But I want to capture something. This is a little caption that the angel said that's important for us to remind ourselves today. The journey is too much for you. Can you repeat that with me? The journey is too much for you. We wrestle with the notion as human beings that we can do life on our own. But we were never created to do life on our own. And it's just a reminder that, yes, we live in a, a difficult, challenging, sinful world. And that we can't face it alone. We don't have the strength. We don't have the, the anything that we need to be able to accomplish that. And that's where... I know I do, and I know all of us probably struggle in that place a lot. So 40 days. Now, where did he go after 40 days? Do you remember the story? Went to Mount Horeb. You know what Mount Horeb is? Sinai. Now, if you read the story, does God tell him to go there? No. He just kind of wanders off and probably keeps running. Pretty good runner, so he kept running. Um, is Mount Horeb or Sinai closer to Israel and the issue or farther away? It's farther away. It's about 200 miles away. And again, God sustained him, but there's some interesting notes to bring to your attention. Actually, from where he was, it would have taken about 11 days. It took him 40 Interesting. Is there something in there for you and me? He went from running to walking to, I believe, praying and communing with God. And he went back to the place where God's covenant was with his people. So there might have been something very significant for him to be at that place where God first gave his covenant commandments of being my people. Uh, kind of in, in, in written form, if you will. So we know the rest of the story he ends up in this cave, and, and he's just, again, and he's, he's not healed, he's not better, he's not well, because he goes back into hiding again. He's not going around people, he's not going back to take on Jezebel. It's all just happening here where he's saying, I need to get away, I need more time. And God honors that. He could have said, uh, uh, no, 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 I'm going to steer you this way. No, the, the Jezreel's back that way. You know, go back that way. God let him wander a bit. But he must have spent some time praying, pausing, and stopping because the journey should have been a lot quicker than that. Then God reveals his mighty power through wind and an earthquake and through fire. But we know what really got his attention was what? still small voice. So the lesson for us is there a quiet place, is there a cave, if you will, where we just turn off all the electronics, Bobby, and we turn off everything that light brings us, and we say, I'm going to have to pause here. I need to be re-energized. So what is our cave today, where we need that time? And twice, God says, oh, by the way, what are you doing here? 
That's not a good thing for God to tell you. So why are you here, by the way? He, he knew. He was just kind of, you know, playing with him a little bit. And so Elijah just kind of lets everything out. He just uh, unloads on God. All right, here we go. Because I've been jealous for the Lord, right? True. This is a true or false. Tell me if you think it's true. The children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. That's, that was true. Um, killed all the prophets, or most of them. Well, they thought they did, so it's kind of true. Even though there were 101, at least. They seek to take my life. Is that true? These are all the things he tells God. Very true. And um, I alone am left. Is that true? Not true. Remember what I said earlier. God plus me plus one is the majority. Never been alone. And secondly, God says, no, I have how many people in Israel? 7,000 7, people in Israel. So God gives Elijah some instructions. He says, hey, I want you to appoint a pagan king, Hazael. That seems like an odd request. And you remember the name of Yehu? Jehu? Yahu? I don't see that. <laughs> we'll go with Jehu. <laughs> he says, appoint him over Israel. And he says, I want you to appoint a man by the name of Elisha to be your servant and kind of your understudy. I want you to disciple Elisha so he can take over your ministry. So all these things he gave, and he told him to go right back through where to do this. The, the journey, if we saw a map, would take him right through the, the area of Jezreel. So God is saying, I want you to go right back to the place, and I want you to face your fears with me as your strength. Okay? Did you, I don't know, if maybe you don't realize this, but there's one command that Jesus gave more than any other. You know what that was? Yeah. That's a good one. I like that. Go. Go there for it. Mm -hmm. Fear not. Mm -hmm. Fear not. That's, that's the most common command. He says, I am with you. Even though as we were continue to read the story, we just want to shake Elijah and go, man, can you not listen to God? Because even still, he didn't follow God's actual instruction. It was Elisha that appointed Jehu. And he went to, um, to meet with Elisha first, and he got everything kind of mixed up, but he still didn't even follow after all of that. He got confused or something, but he does go back eventually and face the battle. It's interesting how when, when, when he had this cave experience, God says, I want you to go back and represent me before the people. I want you to be my witness. I want you to be my, my servant. And I think when we're dealing with discouraging situations, and, you know, it's amazing, a couple of pastors at the pastor's retreat were saying there's been a, a complete change in, in the, the whole mentality of our church. We decided as a body we're going to get involved in our community. And we're going to get out and we're going to, we're going to mingle, you know, like that term, we're going to mingle with people that desire their good. And it says, all of the things that used to just kind of be a battle for us began to dissolve because we're focused on the mission. We're focused on what God has called us to, to make disciples. And he said, everything has changed. We, we don't get into some of these little issues anymore. And I think what, Eli what God is telling Elijah to do and what it says to us is, is, you know, as you serve, as you lead, as you bring my name glory, that's what is is the most healing thing that you can do almost, aside from your intimate relationship with Christ, is to get involved in his mission. That changes everything. Just a reminder then. So as we look at this story, there's some things I'd like to, just to remind us with. But if you look at the scriptures really carefully, especially in the life of Christ, there's a lot of stories how, how uh, there were storms, there were insurmountable situations. It, was, it seemed like there was no hope left. We see Peter faced with a walking on the water. He begins to sink. We see the disciples all 
madly trying to save themselves in a, in a sinking boat. And what is the remedy in those situations? And there are many, many more of these. What is the remedy in these situations? Because it's the same remedy that happened um, in this storyline. It's look at me. Look at me. It's our human nature to fixate on the storms. We struggle with that. In fact, a lot of us are kind of enamored with conspiracy theories and, and how everything is going to take place before God returns. You know, folks, today I, I, we know some, and God reveals definitely some things that help us in our faith and in our journey, but there's a reason why God hasn't told us everything that's going to happen just before he returns because he does not want us to lose our sight that's fixed on him. Because I think Elijah represented Jesus before Ahab. Because as he was in front, he was guiding and he was leading and he was going through the storm. He was kind of paving the way to get back to the city safely. And that's part of the type of this story that we see. So we, can, we have a choice today that we can focus on the crisis or we can focus on the cross. And the challenge for us as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventists, is to focus on the cross. That doesn't mean it's, it, that we shouldn't study and, and, and grow and expand what we understand about his return, about, about his beautiful prophecy. That doesn't, doesn't mean that. It just means always go back to, to refocus on Christ as the center of it all. Okay? Even despite the many failures and the depression, and everything that Elijah went through, God never once gave up on him. And I find great hope in that today. He was constantly running apart from God, doing his own thing, and disobeying. And, and, and God says, it's okay, you know, we'll, we'll, let's get back and let's get back on track. Let me put you back in the game of life, and let's do this together. That's what he's saying. We were never meant to do life by ourselves. I'll share a story with you. He was considered the fastest man on the earth at the time. It was the 1992 Olympics. His name was Derek Renman. Maybe you've heard this story before, but he was favored to win a couple of different meter races, in particular the 400 meter race. He was heavily favored to win the gold medal. And I mean, there's so much practice that goes into all of this, and he was prepared, excited, and ready. He could just kind of sense that gold medal in his sights. And the race started, and he was swiftly distancing himself from the rest of the group and, and not too far, kind of seeing the goal, seeing the, the finish line in sight. And he's giving everything he had, and then he just felt the shearing pain just tear at his legs, so much so that it knocked him on the ground. He kind of fell face first on the pavement. Just traumatized. He tried to get up with that just like a knife was stabbing him in his leg and he realized he could not finish the race running at all. The medics start to come out there and they're, they're trying to attend to him and he kind of pushed them aside. And he tried to get up, and he tried the best he could to, to somehow finish that race. And all of a sudden, now the stands are with this crazed man, a pretty good-sized man. And he was just running onto the, onto the track, and, and a couple of security guards met him. And he's like, he just pushed them aside, and he just kept running. And he gets right next to Derek. He, he comes alongside him, and he puts his arm around him, and he says, Son, you don't have to do this. It was his father. He says, in tears, he says, yes, I do, Dad. I need to finish. I need to finish this race. He says, okay. We'll finish together. So they hobbled. All the runners have long since passed. The race was over, but they hobbled. Best they could, the short distance they had, and they, they crossed the finish line together. <coughs> And all of the announcers and the press acknowledged that this was the most memorable event that took place during those Olympics. 
And there was a thunderous applause. There was the greatest ovation of any event that took place in this whole experience as they crossed that finish line together. And I'm just reminded that, yes, we're in a, we're in a race. Sometimes we get off the path. Sometimes we get diverted. But I love the promise of Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. But I press on to take hold of that which Christ took hold of me. I press towards the goal to win the prize for which Christ has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So as we also know, as we finish that race, we're going to cross a line called the pearly gates. And I suspect that that applause of the heavenly host will be worth it then. And then coming to the place where we see Jesus face to face. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Keep running. Don't give up hope. But keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. We'll finish the race. Keep running. Let's close the prayer. Father, all of us have a story. And all of us have a testimony. And all of us struggle... And I just pray that all of us realize our desperate need for you today. That you become our, our guide. That you'll run before our life and our chariot and lead us to the gates of your city. That nothing deter us, Lord, from that course. Yes, we may stumble. Yes, we may fall. Yes, we may struggle, Lord. But you're there to pick us up. We thank you for never giving up on us, and we thank you for your deep love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Pete. You don't have to do this alone. Remember that. Wherever you are, whoever you are, you don't have to do this alone. Now here at the church, we're going to be partaking of communion. If you're in Wayne County and you're homebound or otherwise bound, message me and I'll drop by and we can partake of communion together at home. Otherwise, we'll see you next Sabbath and have a good week.